Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we get a little historical as we read about The Struggles of Charles Goodyear, written by George Taule. Charles Goodyear is credited as discovering how to vulcanize rubber. You may also recognize the name Goodyear from tires. According to the Goodyear website, this is actually where their name came from. I have included a link to the website in the show notes for further reading. Also, in case you were wondering, according to the website tech-faq.com, other uses of vulcanized rubber are for making rubber hoses, shoe soles, tires, bowling balls, bouncing balls, hockey pucks, toys, erasers, and instrument mouthpieces. I will also include that website in the show notes as well. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Liftoff! We have a liftoff! We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Struggles of Charles Goodyear Never did any man work harder, suffer more keenly, or remain more steadfast to one great purpose of life than to Charles Goodyear. The story of his life, for the most part mournful, teems with touching interest. No inventor ever struggled against greater or more often returning obstacles or against repeated failures more overwhelming. Goodyear is often compared as a martyr and hero of invention to Bernard Palissy, the potter. He is sometimes called the Palissy of the 19th century, but his sufferings were more various, more bitter, and more long-enduring than ever were even those of Palissy, while the result of his long, unceasing labors were infinitely more precious to the world. For if Palissy restored the art of enameling so as to produce beautiful works of art, Goodyear perfected a substance which gives comfort and secures health to millions of human beings. Charles Goodyear was born at New Haven, Connecticut in 1801. He was the eldest of the six children of a leading hardware merchant of that place, a man both of piety and of inventive talent. When Charles was a boy, his father began the manufacture of hardware articles, and at the same time carried on a farm. He often required his son's assistance so that Charles' schooling was limited. He was very fond of books, however, from an early age, and instead of playing with his mates, devoted most of his leisure time to reading. It was even while he was a schoolboy that his attention was first turned to the material, the improvement of which for common uses became afterwards his life work. He happened to take up a thin scale of India rubber, says his biographer, peeled from a bottle, and it was suggested to his mind that it would be a very useful fabric if it could be made uniformly so thin and could be so prepared as to prevent its melting and sticking together in a solid mass. Often afterward, he had a vivid presentiment that he was destined by providence to achieve these results. The years of his youth and early manhood were spent in the hardware trade in Philadelphia and then in Connecticut, and at 24 he was married to a heroic young wife who shared his trials and was ever to him a comforting and encouraging spirit. From boyhood, he was always devout and pure in habits. On one occasion, soon after his marriage, he wrote to his wife while absent from her, I have quit smoking, chewing, and drinking all in one day. You cannot form an idea of the extent of this last evil in this city, New York, among the young men. Charles Goodyear's misfortunes began early in his career. He failed in business, his health broke down, and through life thereafter he suffered from almost continual attacks of dyspepsia. He was, moreover, a small, frail man with a weak constitution. 
He was imprisoned for debt after his failure, nor was this the only time that he found himself within the walls of a jail. That was almost a frequent experience with him in afterlife. It was under discouragements like these that Goodyear began his long series of experiments in India rubber. Already, this peculiar substance, a gum that exudes from a certain kind of very tall tree, which is chiefly found in South America, had been manufactured into various articles, but it had not been made enduring, and the uses to which it could be put were very limited. There is no space here to follow Goodyear's experiments in detail. He entered upon them with the ardor of a fanatic and the faith of a devotee. But he very soon found that the difficulties in his way were great and many. He was bankrupt in bad health with a growing family dependent on him and no means of support. Yet he persevered through years of wretchedness to the very end. It is a striking fact that his very first experiment was made in a prison cell. During a long period occupied by his repeated trials of invention, he passed through almost every calamity to which human flesh is heir. Again and again he was thrown into prison. Repeatedly he saw starvation staring him and his gentle wife and his poor little children in the face. He was reduced many times to the very last extreme of penury. His friends sneered at him, deserted him, called him mad. He was forced many times to beg the loan of a few dollars with no prospect of repayment. One of his children died in the dead of winter when there was no fuel in the cheerless house. A gentleman was once asked what sort of a looking man Goodyear was. If you meet a man, was the reply, who wears an India rubber coat, cap, stock, vest, and shoes with an India rubber money purse without a cent in it, that is Charles Goodyear. Once, while in the extremity of want, when he was living at Greenwich, near New York, he met his brother-in-law and said, Give me ten dollars, brother. I have pawned my last silver spoon to pay my fare to the city. You must not go on so. You cannot live in this way, said the other. I am going to do better, replied Goodyear cheerily. It was by accident at last that he hit upon the secret of how to make India rubber durable. He was talking one day to several visitors, and in his ardor, making rapid gestures, when a piece of rubber which he was holding in his hand accidentally hit against a hot stove. To his amazement, instead of melting, the gum remained stiff and charred like leather. He again applied great heat to a piece of rubber, and then nailed it outside the door where it was very cold. The next morning he found that it was perfectly flexible and this was the discovery which led to that successful invention which he had struggled through so many years to perfect. The main value of the discovery lay in this, that while the gum would dissolve in a moderate heat, it both remained hard and continued to be flexible when submitted to an extreme heat. This came to be known as the vulcanization of India rubber. Two years were still to elapse, however, before Goodyear could make practical use of his great discovery. He had tired everybody out by his previous frequent assertions that his invention had been perfected, when it had until now always proved a failure. Many a time he had gone to his friends, declaring that he had succeeded, so that when he really had made the discovery, nobody believed in it. He was still desperately poor and in wretched health. Yet he moved to Woburn in Massachusetts, resolutely continuing his experiments there. He had no money and so baked his India rubber in his wife's oven and saucepans, or hung it before the nose of her tea kettle. Sometimes he begged the use of the factory ovens in the neighborhood after the day's work was over, and sold his children's very school books in order to supply himself with the necessary gum. At this time, he lived almost exclusively on money gifts from pitying friends, who shook their heads in their doubts of his sanity. Often his house had neither food nor fuel in it. His family were forced to go out into the woods to get wood to burn. They dug their potatoes before they were half grown for the sake of having something to eat. Goodyear was terribly afraid he should die before he could make the world perceive the great uses to which his discovery might be applied. What he was toiling for was neither fame nor fortune, 
but only to confer a vast benefit on his fellow men. At last, after infinite struggles, the absorbing purpose of his life was attained. India rubber was introduced under his patents and soon proved to have all the value he had in his wildest moments claimed for it. Success thus crowned his noble efforts, which had continued unceasingly through ten years of self-imposed privation. India rubber was now seen to be capable of being adapted to at least 500 uses. It could be made as pliable as kid, tougher than oxhide, as elastic as whalebone, or as rigid as flint. But, as too often happens, his great discovery enriched neither Goodyear nor his family. It soon gave employment to 60,000 artisans and annually produced articles in this country alone worth eight millions of dollars. Happily, the later years of the noble, self-denying inventor were spent at least free from the grinding penury and privations of his years of uncertainty and toil. He died in his 60th year in 1860, happy in the thought of the magnificent boon he had given to mankind. Uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. And as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop.